evening. My name is Laura Carter. I'm with the Space Coast Transportation Planning Organization. I'd like to welcome you all and thank all of you for coming this evening. We appreciate a good turnout. Um, we are presenting this evening our alternatives that we have been working on for the last few months, our last public meeting we had in May. Um, we took all of your suggestions and issues and opportunities, and Travis um, Hills here is with the Hiddleston Associates, our consultant, who's been working on these numbers for you. We'll be presenting after I give you a brief introduction. Um, just quickly, I would like to point out the, the TPO staff. We won't go through all the introductions, but if you just raise your hand and let everybody know. We have a lot of our staff here supporting us this evening. Kim? <laughs> um, and Kills and Associates. Uh, we have uh, multiple individuals from the consulting team. So after our presentations, walk up to any of us if you have any questions and we'd be happy to answer them or try to find out the answer for you if we don't know it directly. Okay, so I'm gonna go over quickly what we have been studying. Um, where does the study fit in the overall transportation planning process? This is just one study, a phase of all the phases that we go through to implement new transportation projects. And then I'm gonna briefly just sum up what we've been doing during this particular study, where we are and what we've already accomplished. And then Travis will present the um, alternatives to you. And after that, we will open up the floor and meet in the back and the work you can see a lot closer than what you're going to see on the screen here if you haven't already looked at our boards, the alternatives that we've come up with. And I hope everyone got, grabbed a feedback form and when you signed in and we'd be happy for you to do both sides, especially the side that gives us your preferred options for each of the intersections and the typical so what are we studying? We are studying with the road from Agali Boulevard up to Lake Washington intersection. We're looking at the signalized intersections and seeing what kind of uh, traffic signal coordination options are available to us. Also the pedestrian bicycle features at those intersections and what is lacking there now and what we'd like to have implemented. And along the corridor itself overall, uh, continuous sidewalk features and bicycle features which we don't have any on the road at this particular segment right now. Also our transit stops and access to the businesses. Um, right now we have a bike lane section that you can just turn wherever you would like. And we're looking at maybe accommodating some medians in one of the alternatives. Um, this is what I wanted to point out to you that I hope that everybody understands. Transportation planning is a multi-year, long-term, we don't do anything fast in government, I hate to say it. We started many, many years ago, I won't even go back to 2006, getting crash data, but in 2015, we did do a countywide safety study. That study looked at our crashes and we identified corridors that were high crash corridors, both for vehicles and for bicycle pedestrian focus. From there, we identified five road safety audits on different corridors, and we also did five corridors for bicycle pedestrian safety. That report on the 2016 Wickham Road was one of those corridors that we studied. Unfortunately, it does have high crash rates. We had a citizen um, who did uh, stress some very significant concerns at our board with them, which then focused our attention. We knew we had citizen support, so the quarters that we did audits on, we did select Wickham Road as the first one to move into an additional study to say, okay, here's the issues. Let's develop the alternatives that will work for the citizens. From here, we still have to design it. After tonight, you give us your preferred options. We're gonna develop the cost for that finalize a nice package, and we'll submit it, but this is a county maintained road. This is not your local city of Melbourne, and it's not a federal road. We can put federal dollars on it, but that's a different presentation. <laughs> um, so we have to design it. We need money for that, it needs to be programmed. If right-of-way is needed, depending on which options are chosen, that has to be funded, and right-of-way can take years, depending on how much of it we need. After that, then you'll see your backhoe and your construction equipment, but not until then. And if you see on the side, this whole process from beginning to end, any of our transportation studies, from a feasibility to construction, you're not gonna say, see anything done total less than five years. It has to go through all these phases. These phases are there to protect the citizens. We just don't go in, take somebody's property, and build a road because the government says it's needed. So I know it's frustrating. I'm frustrated, I live in the area, but they're there to protect us and make sure the selection that we do do is the right one and is one that the citizens want. So where are we within this part of the pyramid, the Wickham operation analysis? Back 
in March and April, we did do data collection. We looked at the existing conditions. We brought that to you. How many attended the May meeting? No, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm glad you're here this evening though. Um, so we brought those issues and existing conditions. We presented them and we got feedback, additional issues that we might not have observed in the field when we went out or identified through the data that we collected. And we looked at those and developed alternatives. That's what we've been doing all summer. We do have a separate project advisory team that's helped guiding this, which are the players, City of Melbourne, the county, DOT, because DOT does run it, uh, on the intersection of Galley Boulevard, and the TPF. So what we're here tonight, October 25th, we're back here again, taking all those ideas, presenting them to you to get your feedback, what works for you, what does not work for you. After tonight, we will take your votes and look at it, present it to the team, whatever the consensus is, and probably the ones we'll be moving forward with for final cost, developing those final costs, and that will be presented to our TPO board in December. It's on a Thursday, and you have a date, it's at 3 p.m. Um, and he'll give you the information. You are welcome to attend, if you cannot, can email me or Travis, we will take your comments and they'll include it in our agenda package. Remember the TPO is 19 elected officials that represent all of our county. So everybody's gonna see this, we get it on the radar, we get the support, the better chance we have of getting funded programs sooner rather than later. So as I mentioned, Travis is gonna take over from here. Um, hopefully you like some of the alternatives that come up, they were your suggestions and then we will meet one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks once again, everybody, for coming out. Uh, my name is Travis Sills. I've heard that a couple times already. I'm with Pittleson and Associates. I'm the consultant project manager. Uh, I got some other folks here from my firm, and then uh, David Bennett as well. And he's our uh, specialty drainage engineer on the project. So, uh, as Laura mentioned, as, as I go through this, um, what we're going to do is we're going to hold questions until the end, and then we'll reconvene in the back. Um, I know I've heard some uh, things that hopefully we can either address uh, either in the presentation or we can meet with you after and talk through. Uh, some of the issues or concerns uh, that you all may have. So uh, a little bit on the agenda, what I'm gonna go through, I'll go through the schedule. So for those that weren't here uh, for the first meeting and Laura already briefly went over this, uh, we'll talk about the issues and opportunities that came out of the existing conditions. This is really what geared our, oper or our uh, alternatives that we have in the back. Uh, we're gonna go through that future conditions analysis, a couple slides on what we do from an operational perspective to see if these things are actually gonna work. And then we'll talk short-term improvements, intersection improvements, and the roadway improvements, uh, or the typical sections that we have along the core. Then we'll talk a little bit about next steps, schedule, and how you can get involved uh, both tonight and beyond. So as Laura mentioned, this is our study corridor. Hopefully everyone here, we are on Wickham Road. That is what we're looking at. If you come in confused, uh, looking for a different road, you're probably in the wrong place. So we're looking at Wickham Road from O'Galley up to Lake Washington. Uh, we have variable speed limits. We have uh, 35 miles an hour uh, kind of south of the McDonald's area or the Northgate Plaza. And then north of that, we're at 40 miles per hour. Our AADT, this is our annual average daily traffic. This is how much traffic is on the road per day. Uh, we range between 30,000 and 35,000. Keep in mind, these counts were taken uh, towards the beginning of the year. So uh, I know that there is a perception that there's a lot of cars out here. That is, not, uh, that is not something to deny. There are a lot of cars on this roadway. So that's one thing that we're dealing with. A Little bit on the schedule. So uh, just in a nutshell, we went through existing conditions for the beginning of the project. We had our public meeting back in May for existing conditions. Uh, what we've been working on is this really long, dark gray bar in the middle, which is our alternatives analysis. Really going through, looking at the different roadway alternatives that we could have at each intersection, looking at the typical sections, doing operational analysis on those to see what could actually work moving forward, um, and then also assessing the different right-of-way uh, cost impacts that are associated with each of those. Uh, we're at our public workshop. We are in uh, late October, and we'll talk a little bit about next steps towards the end of the presentation. So on to issues and opportunities. So there were two different classes of issues and opportunities that we looked at along this corridor. The first one being multimodal uh, issues and opportunities, really dealing with uh, pedestrians, transit, and bicyclists along this corridor. So as most people know, uh, most of you probably live along this corridor or take it regularly. 
very few bike uh, pedestrian facilities. So uh, on, especially on that west side of the roadway, what you'll see on this blue line on that west side is the lack of pedestrian facilities that are out there. So that's something that hopefully, if you looked at the typical sections, we're trying to either add shared use paths, wider sidewalks on both sides of the road to really complete those facilities. Uh, transit stop enhancements are also a big deal. Um, I know that we had some concerns from the first public meeting. I've been out there, I've seen it. Uh, Jim Weisenfeld from Space Coast Area Transit is also very well aware of these issues that the buses come and they essentially drop people into the ditches that are out there. So what you'll see is on these different concepts where we have transit stops at the intersections, we've shown that boarding the lighting pad and what you can do to uh, add a sidewalk connection back to the sidewalk we could possibly build out here uh, to kind of connect all those facilities together. For the transit stops in between, that's gonna be something that gets addressed during our preferred concept. So once we come up with a typical section, we're gonna run that along the entire corridor and then tie in all those transit stops so that they're all covered. Uh, and then another thing is the, uh, or the main, the other main piece is those bicycle facilities. So there's no bicycle facilities out there. There's no shoulders, no bicycle lanes. The sidewalk is five feet um, at best in some locations or it's not present, really not a usable bike facility either. So what we're hoping to do is address that within our typical section. So then moving on to our vehicular utility and drainage issues. So these are uh, kind of moving away from the pedestrian and bicycle more towards the vehicular side and, and what, what these impact in terms of our alternatives. So uh, left turn crash intersections. So these were areas where uh, we had quite a few left turn crashes. Uh, O'Galley was one of those spots, Aurora, uh, Lake Washington, and then Lansing. So what we've done is we've put together concepts that uh, hope to alleviate some of those left turn crash issues by providing uh, what we call a neutral or a positive offset for your left turn lane. So uh, as you all probably have noticed when you're driving along this corridor, if you pull up in a left turn lane, when you look straight across, you'll probably be looking at another car and you can't necessarily see if there's any through vehicles coming at you. Right. What we were trying to provide is provide a little bit of an offset there so that those cars are shifted over so you can get a clearer view of any oncoming cars that are coming towards you. So uh, it's one thing that we're doing to try and address this situation. Left turn angle crash areas. Um, these were a big deal with our center two-way left turn lane that we have out there today. Um, I know I heard someone reference it as a uh, suicide lane as well. So I will not use that wording. That's something that I heard from the public. So uh, don't put me on record on that. So, uh, but the two, the two main areas that we really saw was through the Northgate Plaza and then kind of down just north of Trimble. We didn't come up with a concept for that, but we did come up with an access management concept Are for the Northgate. Are we supposed to be able to see this while All you're talking? These, all of these, uh, so a lot of these issues are going to be on the boards in the back. So, yeah. Do you have a pointer? At least you can point to where not. you're talking about. I do not, unfortunately. So, um, so what what we're looking at for the left turn angle crash areas is really access management improvements, trying to make sure that we uh, either do some creative things to uh, eliminate those kind of conflicts, those left turn conflicts from the side street. Uh, peak hour queuing, that was also a big deal. I mean, everybody's driven along this corridor in the peak hour. It's pretty much congested all the way from O'Galley up to Lake Washington. What we're hoping is that our intersection concepts as we go through those will help alleviate a lot of those issues along the corridor. And then one big thing with utilities and drainage, this is gonna be something that we're really gonna flush out over the next month. It impacts what we're gonna do with our typical sections as well. We have quite a few utilities, especially on the west side of the road, and a lot of drainage just as well. So what are we gonna to do to uh, both accommodate pedestrians and bicyclists while trying not to uh, increase the cost of this project too much by impacting those different facilities that are out there. So just a, a quick slide on the future no build operations. So this is uh, kind of that next step. Once we come out of existing conditions, we've analyzed what's out there today, and then we go through and we project or forecast traffic out to 2040. We're trying to find what our kind of worst case scenario would be from a traffic perspective. So as you would imagine, in 2040, a lot of these volumes are gonna get much higher and we're gonna see a lot of issues out there. So uh, O'Galley is, is projected to be level service E or F, uh, just like grading in school. A is great. You want all your intersections to be A, A or B, that's perfect. Everything's flowing, you're, you're going through pretty quickly. Once you get down into E or F, that's where you're sitting there for a couple cycles. You know, you come up, you hit it at a red light, light turns green, no one moves, yeah. and then you're sitting there for another red light. So that's what you're getting into when you're kind of in that e, e to F category. And what we're seeing is that multiple intersections along this corridor fall into that in the future. And then, <laughs> and then a lot of our segments do as well. So 
uh, we're seeing that really that kind of corridor-wide congestion really just exacerbates as you go into that future design year. So what are we going to do to fix it? So after we've identified our issues, what are we going to do to fix all this? So the future build alternatives, we have three separate categories for these. Uh, one is our short-term improvements. What are things that we think can go out and be implemented, hopefully within the next one to three years, depending on funding sources. Then the intersection improvements. Some of those are a little bit longer term. Uh, there's something where it may require right away, as Laura had mentioned, so we're talking a few more years to go in and actually implement those. And then our typical section alternatives, so going out, building those pedestrian and bicycle facilities along the corridor. Unfortunately, that's probably going to be your longest term improvement out of all these because there's a lot of issues. Uh, what I like to say is if it's easy, it would have been done already, unfortunately. And so that's what we're trying to struggle with is, is how do we move forward with these alternatives, have the minimum cost impact, minimum right away impact, and still keep the project moving forward. <coughs> so short term improvements, and this is a board in the back as well. Um, hopefully you all got a chance to look at this, but we're looking at a couple different things. So one, um, our pedestrian facility improvements at our intersections. So mainly Aurora and Lake Washington. Out there today, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but there's no uh, pedestrian crosswalks on some crossings. Uh, you don't have uh, those curb returns either for those landing pads, and we'll talk a little bit about how that could possibly look. Uh, adaptive signal control. So really getting into signal timing and making sure that all these uh, signals connect, that they uh, talk to each other, and that you're getting through kind of a platoon of vehicles in, in one green cycle along the corridor. Um, I know that, uh, and I've been out there and driven in Aurora and the Northgate Plaza is just, is, is not, not a good situation right now. I mean, you get stuck at one, and then all of a sudden you come into the back of the queue and you're stuck at the next one. And so, Hopefully with some of those adaptive signal controls that, and actually Brevard County is working on a project right now to alleviate a lot of that. And so uh, that project is going from south of our study area through our study area to the north. So uh, it'll incorporate all these signals that we're looking at right now. Uh, then the spot medians and the directional median opening. So really this is kind of getting at those north gate improvements. Um, you're not taking uh, hardly any right away. There may be a corner clip here or there, but this is something that could be done within the existing roadway right away. Um, with very minimal impacts overall. Um, that's something that can move forward pretty quickly. Uh, and then LED corridor lighting. Uh, we know that we had a pretty high uh, percentage, relatively high percentage of nighttime crashes along this corridor. And so we want to do something to alleviate that. And if we're going in and adding those pedestrian and bicycle facilities, we want to make sure that vehicles can see those folks that are out there traveling as well. So that's something that's becoming a pretty common standard, especially along DOT roadways. Um, and it's something that, that has been embraced by the county uh, if funding arises to be able to put that on with them. And then the last one is PedSafe. And some people may have had some questions about this, say, what, what's PedSafe? Well, it makes pedestrian, uh, it makes it makes it safer for pedestrians, right? Well, how does it make it safer for pedestrians? So what we're looking at is at our three signalized intersections, we'd be looking at uh, installing a technology which would allow uh, the pedestrian to be detected in the crosswalk. And what that does is, let's say that a pedestrian enters the crosswalk on the flashing don't walk hand, right? It's gonna run out. It's gonna run out and they're gonna be stuck in the crosswalk. Well, this technology will actually see them, recognize that, and actually extend that don't walk, or extend that walk time for them so that they can get through the intersection and not have any conflicts with vehicles. Um, it also works on the reverse side, where if a pedestrian is a faster walker and they get through that crosswalk, it may truncate that walk time, uh, let's say it's 40 seconds of walk time, it may truncate it a little bit so that it'll cycle through faster and get those vehicles uh, back on their cycle. So it also helps the operations as well on the reverse side of that. So it's something to really kind of help increase the, the pedestrian safety along the corridor. So moving on to our intersection improvements. So these are, these are a lot of the boards in the back are focused on these. Um, and so we'll kind of walk through each one individually. I'll tell you a little bit, uh, some of the characteristics and some of the thought process that went into each one. Uh, so Galley Boulevard, this would be option A. And this is looking at adding a northbound, southbound, and westbound right turn lane at the intersection. Uh, these were all identified as needs um, for our operational analysis. Uh, we were looking at this option uh, to try and see how we can get this in without impacting uh, as much right away or, or as little right away as we could. Um, so what you'll see is that the construction is around $2 million. Uh, we do have some utility relocations along some of the legs. We do have some power poles out there. Um, the roadway right away, uh, that number includes uh, primarily a lot of the uh, property on the northeast corner, uh, where I think it's a, it's a daycare today. 
Um, and then there's a little bit in front of the Walgreens as well. Um, and we actually stayed away from impacting their parking. So we're, we're kind of on the other side of that. So we're trying to have minimal impacts to the Walgreens. Um, and then the benefit cost ratio. So this is something that uh, is a very engineering way to look at some of these, uh, some of these intersections. And I know some people have some questions about this. Essentially what it does, it's a ratio of your total construction cost to your operational benefit that you get. So we run a lot of confusing simulations. I don't even know what goes into half of them. And we essentially come out with a number that says, you have saved this much time to the average traveler through this intersection. So by adding all these turn lanes, you've saved uh, 60 seconds per cycle on average, as an example. And what that does is that calculates back to a dollar value saved by the citizens or by the community. And we can take that dollar value and compare it to our total cost to see what our benefit cost ratio would be. So if that benefit cost ratio is greater than one, that means that our operational benefits outweigh the total construction cost of this project. So what you'll see for all of these alternatives as we go through, I think all of them are either above two or they're, or they're really close to two. So you're getting a really good rate of return on a lot of these projects in terms of the operational benefits that you'll see on the vehicular side. In addition to this, we would be going in and rebuilding a lot of those pedestrian facilities as well. Uh, Ogale, not so much, it's a state facility. A lot of those uh, facilities are in pretty good shape today, but we would be rebuilding a few of those uh, curb returns on the corners and then adding uh, sidewalk where we don't have it today or rebuilding uh, where we would be impacting. So this would be option B. Um, so this would be, if we didn't want to add that westbound right turn lane, what would we do if we added an eastbound right turn lane? So just kind of flipping it from one side of the intersection to the other. Really what we were trying to do here is see what our benefit would be if we didn't impact the, pro the properties on the northeast corner of the intersection. Uh, what you'll see is that overall, between the two intersections, you have a much higher benefit cost ratio, mainly due to the, to the right-of-way cost that you would have for the previous alternative. So uh, when you're not impacting those northeast corner parcels, you do have some right-of-way on the southwest corner to add that turn lane in pretty easily. Um, even though on the operational side, option A does perform a little bit better, the total cost comparison uh, drives that benefit cost up a little bit uh, for option B. So looking at Aurora Road, so kind of moving, moving up the corridor. Uh, Aurora Road short-term improvements, I wanted to start with that. Uh, so this could be something that, that could possibly be built within the next one to three years. Uh, we would be looking at adding crosswalks on the east and south legs of the intersection to kind of complete that intersection. Adding in those uh, pedestrian landing paths where we don't have them, so mainly on the southeast corner. And we would also be looking at rebuilding the landing pads on the southwest, uh, northeast, and northwest corners as well. I know that some of those aren't in great shape. So we'd be really trying to, to firm up those areas and, and really kind of make it a safe place for a pedestrian to stand or to cross uh, at this intersection. And then in addition- get a bunch of bins, a bus bench finally, to get that place, because I'm so tired of standing and letting the hands bite my ankles there with garbage cans. I mean, the people drop, drop their drinks and they have ant problems. Right, and that's something that, that we'll put in the report as well. Um, but what, what we're what we're doing as a part of this is looking at those transit stops as well. So these are something that uh, could be incorporated in the shorter term. Uh, doesn't necessarily need to be done with the turn lane project. Um, and so we could look at adding those pedestrian or those transit facilities, adding that landing pad, those benches, those uh, trash cans, uh, things like that. And we're in constant coordination with Jim Leisenfeld as well, as I mentioned before. So he's kind of up to speed on what we're showing here and we'll make sure that we coordinate with him uh, as we go to make our final recommendations for the project. So moving on to the uh, kind of longer term intersection improvements, and this would be looking at adding uh, a northbound right turn lane and, a, uh, and a, a westbound right turn lane. And so what we'd be looking at here is, uh, you'll see that that orange coloring, that's all new pavement. Um, so we may be adding a lane where we don't actually add new pavement. And how we're able to do that on that east leg is we're, we're able to do what we call like a lane swap. And so right now there's two lanes going eastbound on Aurora Road. The traffic volumes aren't high enough to really warrant those two lanes at the intersection. And all of the turn lane at the intersection, only one lane feeds it at a time. So uh, what you're able to do is really reduce that receiving lane down to one lane. You can utilize that pavement for the addition of that westbound right turn lane. Uh, what that also does is it helps our westbound skew across the intersection. So right now, 
Uh, if you come into that intersection, you're going westbound, you're trying to go west and across the intersection, uh, you almost have to go essentially 12 feet to your left to be able to cross that intersection. Yeah. Um, and so with this, when we're able to shift those lanes down, you actually straighten that out so you don't have that big skew coming across the middle of that intersection. So uh, there are some benefits to doing that. And then as you all saw on the boards, once we get further east, we widen back out to that four lane uh, undivided along Aurora Road, which we are gonna be talking about that in our, in our next Aurora Road meeting here in a couple weeks on kind of how we can deal with that uh, roadway as well. <coughs> And then we also wanted to present an alternative because the uh, previous alternative, it did have some pretty uh, significant right-of-way impacts uh, for the automotive uh, shop on the southeast corner. So what we wanted to show is if we, if we didn't include that northbound right turn lane, would we still get that operational benefit? And what we're seeing is that overall, yes, we would still be seeing operational benefit by just doing the westbound right. Uh, you would have far less right-of-way impacts, especially to that southeast corner um, if you went this route as well. So moving up to Northgate. So this is getting into those access management improvements. And really what we're trying to do here is, is reduce crashes. So Wickham Road, as Laura mentioned, very uh, relatively high crash rates. We had, I think, uh, over 660 crashes in five years for a one mile stretch of roadway. Um, for perspective, that's quite a bit. <laughs> um, and so this area was really one of those hot spots where we had a lot of those left turn and angle crashes, what we call them. Uh, from that kind of center two-way left turn lane scenario or configuration. So really what we're trying to do here, and I, and I talked with some folks in the back about this, is trying to clean up that access. And, and really we have a lot of driveways along this section. Um, what we wanted to do is move that signal from the plaza, which is where it is today, and move it up to Northgate Street. That will provide us a little more space in terms of access management between the Northgate Plaza signal and the Aurora signal just to the south. I know that's one of those problem areas. People get stuck. If you provide a little bit more space there, you coordinate those signals a little bit better, it'll help that platoon progression along the corridor. And then really getting into the access management, putting in those directional median openings, providing those northbound and southbound left turns into the different parcels, uh, really forcing folks to right turn out and do U-turns. Uh, from the research that we have, uh, both here in Florida and nationwide, a right turn followed by a subsequent U-turn is a much safer maneuver than a left turn out across five lanes or four lanes of traffic. Um, and so what we were doing is what you'll see in this graphic in the back is we've actually provided some kind of bulb out extra pavement areas. So for folks that want to perform that U-turn movement can make that U-turn without hitting uh, a curb on the side of the road. And so that bigger one up at Northgate Street on the southwest corner that was designed specifically for box trucks or U-Haul trucks that may be accessing the storage unit that's on the east side of the roadway down near the current signal today. So trying to accommodate all those different users of this uh, section of the roadway. And then, and then obviously the Northgate Street, if you have the signal there, you're forcing all those folks who want to go north on Wickham up to the signal, and it's a much safer maneuver to make a left turn at a signal um, than it would be to make it across that uh, center to Willow. So then moving up, just up the road, to Venture Lane and Lansing Street. So this was a alternative that came out of our first public meeting. This was something that, um, I can be honest, wasn't even on my radar. Uh, it's a very creative idea, a very creative solution to address some of the issues that we were seeing in this area. Uh, Lansing was one of our high crash locations for left turn and angle crashes coming out uh, for folks coming out of the, the Lansing Ridge development and trying to turn left on the Wickham. What we're looking at here is essentially building a new roadway that would connect uh, down to Venture Lane. I know that there's a, a warehouse district or kind of area that just got built out there. Um, I was informed that there, uh, there's a couple call centers that are trying to add a lot of new jobs out in that area. So, so this would be a prime location to kind of tee up, make a four leg intersection. You're accommodating the folks from Lansing Street who want to come out and make a left turn onto Wickham, very safe maneuver. And then you're also accommodating Venture Lane and folks that are coming out to make a left to go north onto Wickham as well. Um, now at Lansing, we would still be providing access out onto Wickham. It would be uh, right in, what we call right in, right out. So uh, people coming from uh, Lansing Ridge can come make a right to go northbound. And if you're along Wickham, you can make a right into uh, Lansing Street. And it would still provide access to the Wells Fargo and the other development uh, just north of that. We're also looking at providing that left turn access into the kinder care. So we know that uh, there were some conflicts there with the morning, people trying to get to kinder care, the people coming out of Lansing.
and we think that this kind of helps reduce those conflict points in that area as a whole. So uh, trying to provide that reasonable access for everyone uh, kind of that would use that would use this area. And and one thing, so as I caveat this, uh, we met with the school board uh, last week on this concept, and uh, ultimately the first kind of gut reaction was that there wasn't there wasn't a major you know, oh, this could be a fatal flaw, pull it. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna coordinate further with them and really kind of flush this out, see if this could be something that uh, the school board would like to move forward with. There would have to be a lot of coordination between Brevard County and the school board to really get this idea up and moving. So uh, I know that there's some folks here that really love this idea. Um, it's really kind of up to you at this point. You know, we can make the recommendation, but at that point it's out of our hands. And so really kind of push the folks who make these decisions to, to keep this moving forward, um, that, would be, uh, that would be a big, big deal. So moving on to Lake Washington. So this was our early intersection where we only had one alternative. Uh, what we looked at is we looked at a number of different alternatives from an operational perspective along, along this uh, intersection. Uh, we looked at dual lefts, northbound and southbound. Um, really what we were seeing on that is that it just didn't give you the operational benefit that you would see or that you would think uh, because right now you're what we call protected permissive left turn phasing northbound southbound so uh, you either get a green arrow or on the green bulb you can also turn left as well when you go to protected only or when you go to dual lefts uh, two left turn lanes you go protected only so you lose that extra kind of permissive phasing and really the, the cost of putting in that improvement versus the operational benefit that you get really doesn't balance out. Um, so what we settled on and what, or, sorry, well, I'm not even looking at the right slide because this is what I was talking about. So I'll go back to the short term, sorry about that. So, um, so what we're looking at here is instead of doing those dual lefts northbound, southbound, we'd be looking at adding a, uh, another westbound through lane and then dropping it at the Publix. And so um, what we're looking at here is it's kind of a, uh, it, uh, I can't think of the word for it, but it's um, what we're looking at is when you when you add in that westbound through lane, it actually allows less green time for the side street and gives more green time to Wickham because you're allowing that extra capacity. Mm -hmm. So what it does is is Wickham your north south. That's your major movement. You give it more green time. Your operational benefit for the intersection goes up. Um, what we're also looking at doing is extending that westbound left as well, uh, almost back to the LA Fitness. I know that that was a big deal in the existing conditions. I've been out there, I've seen it kind of queue back. Um, and so we're hopefully going to alleviate some of that as well. For this option, uh, we also have space to put in a northbound right turn lane. And so that would be also a, a, an added operational benefit for this intersection. Now, one thing that you will see, that benefit cost ratio is, is starting to get close to one. Mainly, that's due to the, uh, the overall right of way cost. Um, the reason for this, when you look at this board, you won't see a whole lot of red on this board. Where that roadway right away comes in is we would likely need a pond site for this location. Um, we trip uh, permitting in, in this situation because the impervious pavement area, the extra pavement that we're adding is beyond a certain threshold. So when you do that, you need to treat that water and you need to have an offsite pond. So what that would include is a, is a two acre pond somewhere to be determined still, but that's where that high roadway right away cost comes from. So going back to my short term that I should have probably talked about first. So in the interim, what we're looking at doing is adding uh, crosswalks to the west and south legs, uh, looking at rebuilding um, or adding a landing pad to that southwest corner where we have kind of that utility pole and there are some other uh, facilities there that we're gonna have to figure out how to work around. Um, and then also rebuilding the paths on the southeast and northeast corners of this intersection. Really uh, trying to clean this intersection up from a pedestrian perspective. I know that uh, um, when you're using the north crosswalk, if you're walking to the east, it essentially drops you into the uh, westbound right turn lane. Um, and that was something we identified during the RSA or the road safety audit that we did. Um, when we would be looking at that, we'd be looking at moving that crosswalk up a little bit. And so you'd be getting uh, out of that turn lane, essentially putting them onto a landing pad, giving them a safe place to walk. Um, and then obviously going back and adding those bus stops as well. And then this would be the continuation of uh, the previous concept, and this would be the drop lane of Publix. We could talk a little bit more about how we kind of came up to that decision uh, back when we meet at the boards. So then jumping into typical sections, and what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about 
uh, the methodology for how we got to the typical sections that we got to. Um, really what it started out with is our data collection and our crash data. Um, I believe we had over 20 bicycle crashes along this corridor in our five year crash data. And from what I remember, we had over half of those were bicyclists that were in the roadway. So what you're seeing is a high preponderance of people who uh, bicycle is prob probably their primary mode. They're out there in the roadway riding and then getting into conflicts with vehicles that are traveling at relatively high speeds um, and really high volumes along this corridor. So that was kind of the first thing that tipped us, off, tipped us off. Okay, we need to do something out here to protect bicyclists. Um, we also had quite a few pedestrian crashes as well, both crossing and at driveways along the corridor. So what, what are some things that we can look at to really kind of facilitate bicycles along the corridor? So some of the trends in bicycle design and, and why I wanted to go through all these is we had all of these come up at one point in time during the course of our study, either at the first public meeting or through the discussions of the typical sections. So uh, sharrows or shared lane markings, that's kind of the, the base starting point. Is this something that would be feasible for uh, a different pro or a project that you're looking at? Really what we're looking for is um, this would be somebody riding in the road, you have pavement that's out there. It's really made for uh, kind of neighborhood or local streets with lower speed limits. You're really talking kind of 30 miles an hour, that's really kind of a fringe. Um, you like to see kind of 25, 20 or non-posted, so just a neighborhood street. That would be an ideal situation. Um, obviously with road, you're up in that 35, 40 mile an hour with almost 40,000 cars a day. Sharrows were something that was brought up during our first public meeting. It will not move forward um, because of these specific criteria that we're seeing. So you won't see those in any of the typical sections. What you will see though are conventional bike lanes. So this would be just uh, a shoulder uh, that would be paved for bicyclists. You'd have bicycle lane markings. You'd have your, uh, your stripe, uh, stripe to separate that. Um, what you're really trying to do is just separate them from the traffic stream. Uh, this would be something where we looked at bumper bike lanes initially, uh, which is on the left hand side there, and that provides a little bit more comfort for the road user or the bicyclist. But because of kind of the context of the area, uh, we settled on conventional bike lanes. So um, there are no buffer bike lanes on county roadways anywhere yet. Uh, FDOT is starting to put them in. It is now an FDOT standard, so they're starting to go in on some state roadways. But because there is no connecting buffered bike roadway network, there are bike lanes to the north, or there's at least a paved shoulder. It made more sense to go with that conventional bike lane in the roadway for, uh, I believe, two of our typical sections. And then the other option that you'll see as well is a shared use path. And this is something that uh, shared use, it's shared by both pedestrians and bicyclists. With the uh, mix of, of multimodal traffic that we saw here, um, this could be an option that could be fairly successful out here. Uh, at least I, I feel that way. Um, it, it really increases that comfort for both users. Um, you're uh, probably sitting somewhere, uh, your typical is about 10 feet. You could go a little bit wider if you have a little bit more right away, but it provides a pretty good buffer between you and all those cars that are traveling along with them. And it gets those bicycles out of the roadway so that there's even less conflict than there would be with a traditional bike. And so a little bit about kind of the types of bicyclists and why we're gearing our recommendations towards uh, what you see in the back. So this is uh, a national uh, study that was done. And really there's kind of four different classes of bicyclists that are on your road. There's the strong and the fearless. So those were the folks that came to our first public meeting and said, I ride in the roadway, I want sharrows on board. That's kind of your, your first class of cyclists. And then there's the enthused and confident. So that may be some of you in this room, definitely not me. I can tell you I'm not in that category, but uh, somebody who, who, who likes to ride, uh, frequently rides, maybe likes riding on trails more than they like riding in the roadway along Wickham Road. And then there's the interested but concerned. So I may kind of fall in, in that interested but concerned and no way, no how category. I've seen the stats, so uh, I know to stay off the roads if I'm, if I'm cycling. But, um, but that could be someone who you know, likes to ride, uh, maybe rides in their neighborhood, things like that, but really doesn't want to use that as their primary mode of transportation because they know that if they go out on the road, there's going to be conflicts out there. People aren't going to see them when they're riding. And then the no way, no how. That's, I'm in my car, I'm driving, gas prices are two twenty-five a gallon, I'm loving it. I know, I'm honestly, I drive an hour and 10 minutes to work every day, so that's kind of where I fit into that. So, um, but that, those are kind of the four different types of bicyclists that are out of these facilities. And to put that in perspective on kind of what facility we should be looking at, and I'll, I'll read this off to you so you don't have to squint too hard, but the competent cyclist, so that's kind of that first two pie, uh, pies on the upper right-hand corner, 
uh, for the speeds and volumes that we have along Wickham Road, they would prefer some type of physical, physically separated facility. So that would be a shared use path or a buffer bike lane. So um, on average, and keep in mind as a national average, national study, that's kind of typically where those folks would fall in terms of what facility would they prefer. When you go over to the concern cyclist, so this is everybody else, this is that back 50% of that chart, you're talking uh, something that's physically separated. So they're not gonna ride in a buffered bike lane. They're not gonna ride in a conventional bike lane. They're probably, they may not ride up the shared use path with the, with the volumes that we got. That, that bubble right there should be another uh, 30,000 higher on that chart, but 10,000 was, was what it went up to. So um, you're definitely in that physically separated facility area. So how did that lead us to our typical sections? As I kind of mentioned a little bit, um, we have a couple different alternatives. We have four specific alternatives that we're looking at. Our existing condition to kind of get everybody up to speed, uh, everybody knows this, but we have four or five uh, 12 foot lanes out there, four of them for travel. One is that center two-way left turn lane. You do have sporadic sidewalk, um, and pretty much once you get north of Trimble, um, you have really, you have no sidewalk on the west side, and then uh, sidewalk on the east that's in pretty bad shape from what I've seen. Um, so alternative number one, what we're looking at is really maintaining that pavement that's out there today, uh, pushing that curb and gutter out, and then adding in that five-foot on-street bike facility. We'd be also looking at adding uh, a wider sidewalk, an eight-foot sidewalk on both the west and east sides of the roadway. This would obviously involve a little bit more right-of-way, a little bit more coordination as you're kind of pushing that out um, and getting into a little bit more construction impacts on that side. Alternative number two. Uh, the common theme here is we're maintaining that two-way left turn lane. So that would be, uh, if you didn't do any access management improvements, this would be kind of what you're looking at. Uh, we would be maintaining everything that's within the curb line today and adding all of our pedestrian and bicycle facilities outside of that. So looking at that 10-foot uh, shared use path that I had mentioned before, outside, uh, disconnected from the, the roadway itself. And then option three and four, alternative three and four, this is where we're going in and providing more of that access management treatment and providing uh, raised, uh, raised medians along the corridor. So there's opportunities here for uh, landscaping. Um, that's definitely a, a benefit here. Uh, we're looking at reducing a lot of those access points and really increasing that safety, overall safety along the corridor, trying to drive down that 660 number that I had mentioned before. And then what we did is we mirrored the options that we had in alternatives one and two. So alternative three would be the median plus the uh, on-street bike facilities and the wider sidewalk. Alternative four would be the, uh, the median with the shared use path that's off the side of the road. And really this is kind of what we're all leading to is, is how do we make these decisions? So we have four alternatives. We came to you all. We want to get your input. Please fill out the survey. So fill out the comment card. We also have done an online survey as well that's set up back there. And so folks can get into that um, and, and, and uh, provide their insight and their feedback to that. Uh, but this is really, you know, that and then this is what we're going to use to really kind of make that decision. And so the, the top four rows of the chart really get into uh, mobility for all users. So improving that pedestrian and, uh, mobility and safety. All of these alternatives do a great job of that. We're either adding wider sidewalks, bicycle facilities, or that shared use path. Um, improve that bicycle facility. As I mentioned before, we're, we're improving that in a lot of cases. The yellow checks are the on-street bike facilities. So those obviously aren't going to be as preferred by bicyclists as a shared use path would be. Uh, thus the yellow instead of the green in that situation. Vehicular mobility. If you maintain that two-way left turn lane, you don't really have any change from what's out there today. But if you do go to a raised median, um, you do restrict some of those access points along the corridor. I know I've chatted with a few folks about that at Northgate. Um, but you do increase that safety greatly along the corridor. So that's what those green checks come into play. You're really getting into providing those uh, less, the less conflict points along the corridor, really getting into improving safety along this corridor. And then the bottom, the bottom four rows get into cost, and this is also going to be a determining factor as well. Uh, what you'll see is a lot of green $3 signs along this. So uh, you will have relatively high right-of-way impacts. I mean, like I mentioned, if it was easy, it would have been done already. That's part of the reason why we're having these issues is we do have pretty tight right-of-way, especially south of Trimble. Um, there's a couple of parcels on the west side that are pretty much right up against the roadway. So it'll be tough to get out of that uh, without having any right-of-way impact. So pretty much all these alternative would need between zero and 10 feet of right-of-way along the corridor. It would vary parcel by parcel. Um, the drainage impacts, 
uh, what you'll see the difference there for alternative two is we're not moving the curb and gutter that's out there today. So uh, whenever you're moving curb and gutter, you're adding a lot more in terms of your uh, rebuilt curb, your new pipe system potentially that you have to put in there. Um, depending on what these alternatives shake out from the drainage analysis, we may also need a couple ponds along the corridor as well to alleviate uh, some of the things that we have going on out there. Utility impacts, like I mentioned, we have utilities all along the west side of the roadway. Um, if it was the small wooden poles, those are pretty easy to deal with, but when you're getting into the big metal transmission lines, those are a little bit harder. So uh, moving those is roughly 100 to 150 grand a pop. Um, we would look for, we would be looking to not move them. So probably if we built that sidewalk, we would be going around those poles, but depending on where you're at, that may incur more right-of-way costs. So that's something that we'll have to weigh as we go into that preferred alternative uh, alignment. And then the total cost comparison. So this would be uh, across the four alternatives, all of these would be a relatively high cost in terms of an overall project. But when you're comparing them against each other, alternative number two is really your low cost alternative. You're maintaining the roadway as it is today, you're building to the outside. Alternative number one, maintaining the roadway that you have today, pushing a little bit out for those bike lanes and then adding the sidewalk. And then alternatives three and four, when you're getting into that race meeting in the middle, you're really starting to see a lot more of those higher costs associated with that construction. So a little bit on next steps and schedule. So the upcoming tasks, we are gonna get into our preferred alternatives. So with your all input tonight, we actually have a meeting first thing tomorrow morning with the project advisory team. Uh, we're gonna present all of your feedback and really get a feel for who like what concept. Do we wanna go with alternative A at O'Galley or alternative B? Etc. along the core, what typical section do we want to do? When we, when we decide upon that preferred typical section, we're actually going to take that and run that along our entire corridor and connect to those different intersections that we've already come up with. Really what we're trying to get to there is what are we going to do with the transit facilities? What utility impacts are we going to have? What right-of-way impacts are we going to have? And really flush that out before we go to the TPO board. And we're going to go to the TPO board December 14th at 3 p.m. Um, so if you all want to come, Listen to me talk through some of this and present our preferred alternative. It would be much appreciated. Uh, just as long as you don't heckle me. Don't heckle me, please. I, uh, I don't do well being heckled. So, um, but how can you get involved? How can you get involved tonight? So tonight, we want you to review the concept boards. I know everybody's probably taken a look through most of them. Come up, ask us any questions um, that didn't get clarified during the presentation. Complete the comment form or the online survey. So the online survey should be on the back page of that comment form. You can type that right in your computer and it'll come up with the, uh, the survey that's actually on the back two computers or you can fill it out tonight. Uh, we also still have the uh, comment website open. So that's that uh, map website where you can go in and click on it and write in the comments. That's still active. You can get in, leave us additional comments on that. We're checking that weekly. And then contact information. So I'll leave this up for a little bit. Um, we also have some business cards back there as well that have this information on it as well. So um, once again, thank you for coming. Thanks for letting me uh, talk your off for the past half hour or so, maybe a little longer. Um, and uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions uh, down at the back.